Baby Dog tells Bat Midler and all those out there, kiss her honey. That was West Virginia Governor Jim Justice during his State of the State address with a message for critics. The governor's going to join us in just a few minutes in his first national TV interview since that speech. Did he ever think his state would be such a big topic in the national conversation? And why does he think so-called elites look down on West Virginia? Always interesting to talk with Governor Justice, and we'll do that shortly. Better is beware. Two former NFL coaches say their owners offered to pay them to lose. I'll ask an odds maker if tanking is something we need to consider when placing bets. Great to be back with you. I'm Joe Donald. My thanks to Mike McCarra for sitting in this week. We begin here with a bombshell report that confirms what a lot of skeptics thought. The lockdowns for COVID didn't work. Researchers at Johns Hopkins University say the lockdowns had little or no impact on COVID deaths and maybe even made things worse. They say shutting down the country in the early stages of the pandemic back in 2020 prevented just 0.2% of deaths. The researchers writing, we find no evidence that lockdowns, school closures, and limiting gatherings have had a noticeable effect on COVID-19 mortality. In fact, they say limiting gatherings in outdoor public spaces actually increased COVID mortality because people then gathered in inside instead. So think about that. The holidays and gatherings we missed or skipped, the birthday celebrations held over Zoom or maybe driving by your relative's garage and waving. There's also the virtual learning and how it hurt the educational, social, and emotional development of our children, not to mention the economic impact. We lost tens of millions of jobs at the beginning of the pandemic as everyone hunkered down and closed businesses. Many of those jobs we still haven't recovered. Quoting the researchers again here, lockdowns have contributed to reducing economic activity, raising unemployment, reducing schooling, causing political unrest, contributing to domestic violence, and undermining liberal democracy. Bottom line, we did some back in the napkin math today of all the COVID deaths in America, and we are approaching 900,000 at this point in the country. The lockdown essentially saved 1,770 lives. Joining us now to talk more about this, Dr. Brett Jirwa, the testing czar under President Trump. So doctor, I realize this is a novel coronavirus and we're all sort of learning as we go here, but two plus years into this thing, have we learned now for sure the headline that lockdowns don't work? Well, thank you for having me on. And first of all, this was a very comprehensive study. And just to be clear, it wasn't a study in and of itself, but it was a very scientific, rigorous review yeah. of the entire literature, all the studies published worldwide since the beginning of the pandemic. It was done very systematically. And you're right. What they showed was that lockdowns didn't really matter much to COVID-19 mortality. But let me just nuance this a little bit. It wasn't that the behaviors that people did didn't solve problems or, or reduce mortality. It's when you tried to force it on people. So what the study said is if you just give people the information, they will act appropriately and do the right things. But when you impose a government enforced lockdown, you not only didn't help, but in many cases you hurt. That's and that's exactly what we tried to do in the Trump administration is provide people the information and let people make their individual choices for their families. Yeah, that was something that I was trying to figure out the nuance in as well, doctor. And that is, did it help stop the spread? Did it at least initially arrest the spread of the virus? So this study didn't really deal with this. It dealt with COVID-19 mortality right. over a period of time. So um, when we first uh, said 15 days to slow the spread, remember it wasn't a national mandate, it was recommendations on how to do it. And we do feel, and I think the study does support, that it may have delayed a lot of the hospitalizations and deaths in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So it didn't stop them, but it stopped the hospitals from being overrun. But the message of this study, and again, this is a study of all studies, is, is clear that when you have a government imposed mandate, as opposed to giving people the options and the information, it has no effect. And let me just point out another subtlety. This showed that there was no real effect on COVID-19 mortality, but what it didn't look at is overall mortality. We know that when you lock down the country by mandate, cancer deaths, addiction deaths, mm. um, suicide deaths all go up. So you had no COVID-19 benefit, but you likely had a tremendous harm 
to the rest of the public health. And that study didn't even get into that. Right. Let's um, show you one part of this study, doctor, because there was an area, and I dug through this thing. It was pretty deep. You're right. The only area that seemed to have some effect from the lockdowns was the closing of non-essential businesses and particularly bars, which does make sense because this is a place where a lot of people gather indoors. Yes, and, and if you remember under the Trump administration, and I'm not saying we did everything right, but the only thing we really suggested uh, closing or limiting the population of was indoor crowded bars and restaurants, and particularly bars. And this study does show that, and it was a pretty significant effect. Um, don't close schools, don't impose uh, limits on gatherings. When you do that, people just gather in their apartments and you get twice the transmission. Don't close borders, don't do all those silly things. But there was an effect of, of, in this study, particularly on bars, and we know that's a very special place. Look, I'm from New Orleans, I love a good bar as much as anyone, <laughs> but you have to take it from inside, you know, crowded to outside during the peak of the pandemic. I think we're in a different situation right now, of sure. course. What about doctor? And I think you're on the same page with me on this. Critics are going to see this and say, well, see, I told you, they didn't know what they were talking about. The next thing you know, they're going to tell us we didn't need these vaccines. Yeah, I think we, I think we really have to be careful again, because the recommendations that people said, like try to stay out of public crowded places, particularly early in the pandemic when there was no vaccines, there was no countermeasures. Um, those activities did help save lives. The difference in this study is when the government tries to impose it and doesn't let the people and families make decisions for themselves, it's counterproductive. Hmm. Um, so I think that's a very important point. Um, and, and look, vaccines, they are not perfect, but we know that vaccines do prevent mortality. Um, natural immunity is very important and as, is as good or better than two vaccine shots but neither natural immunity or two vaccines are very good against Omicron. Um, it's always a good idea to get boosted to protect you from getting infected. All right, before we let you go, doctor, if there's a pandemic, let's say five years from now, a global pandemic, what's the first thing we should do? What have we learned here? We learned a lot and I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Number one, um, there are a lot of things we could do to prevent a global pandemic. And that is uh, better international oversight and regulation on common ground of BSL-4 laboratories like the one that probably was the origin of this pandemic. There is a lot we need to do in this country. Our surveillance system, archaic. I think the CDC uh, has many great people, but the organization needs a complete overhaul. The CDC is no longer operational and no longer capable to lead the response. Mm. Finally, most importantly, uh, I do think we need to have an ongoing public-private partnership. Uh, I think one of the best things that President Trump did and the Trump administration was engage the private sector. This was not a federal government solution. This was a private sector, academic sector working together. We can't build those on the fly. Look, there's a lot of things we need to do. Um, it is not as easy as just changing the president or getting a new political party in. We have hard work to do. Uh, I think there are clear ways forward and I'm anxious to help. I've never been called by the Biden administration. Um, since they took office to help uh, create those plans. But I'm always anxious and would love to do that to prepare our country for the next pandemic because there will be one. Those are strong words, doctor. Quickly, we're out of time. But what should we do if you don't think the CDC is capable? Well, I think the CDC needs to be revisited, right? The CB CDC can't be in charge. It has to be at a, a, a much higher level because this is not just about controlling the infection. This is preserving our liberty, our economy, uh, mental health, all the things that need to be done at a higher integrative level. And secondly, the CDC needs to become operational. It has become non-focused. It's become, quote, academic in the bad way that they're interested in publishing articles, but they're not as operational as they should be. There are ways to fix this, but the CDC does need to be fixed. Uh, they are a treasure, they're an American jewel, but we need to sort of reorient them to be the CDC of the old, and they're not there now. Dr. Brett Giroir, former White House testing czar. It's always good to have you, sir. Thank you for the time. Thank you. The View looked different this morning. ABC suspending one of its hosts, Whoopi Goldberg, the show briefly acknowledging her absence. Comments earlier this week sparking controversy and outrage. Here's what started it all. The Holocaust isn't about race. No. No. It's well, not about maybe race. It's, it's not about well, race. What is it about? Because you, it's about man's inhumanity to man. 
Democratic political strategist Crystal Knight and Patriot Academy founder Rick Green join us now. Crystal, let's start with you. Um, I guess with, uh, with Whoopi threatening to quit now, she gets a couple of weeks off. We have had others comment that Roseanne Barr was fired for something she said on The View. What's the difference? Well, I think the difference is, you know, Whoopi right now, you know, is having to eat her words. This is something that she should not have stated. It was insensitive. Should she have been suspended for two weeks? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, we've also seen a, a literal iteration of many crazy things that Meghan McCain has stated on that same platform, and she was not suspended. Um, she was actually amplified um, by the show. And so it really depends on which end of the aisle you're looking at. But, I mean, she had the, the president of the Anti-Defamation League on. She apologized in real mm -hmm. time. She acknowledged the error. Um, and so it just seems that, you know, The View wanted to take this drastic step, and they've done it. And so so now she has to live with it. Two weeks. Rick, was that the right call? Well, I'm checking my temperature because I'm finding myself uh, agreeing with Crystal. Hey, how are y'all doing? <laughs> I, look, we've all said stupid things, right? We've all been emotional and said things we probably shouldn't have said. We've all been ignorant and said things that we thought we were right on. You Turns do that on we my show every other week, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I just think we should be forgiving. You know, when somebody apologizes, the American people are forgiving. Whoopi's apologized for this, you know, and, and, and I think she says ignorant, uninformed things all the time. It's why I don't watch The View. But let the viewers of The View make that decision and let the network decide if they think somebody's becoming so caustic they need to move on. That's fine. The danger here, though, is this combination of the media, the government, and the left silencing anyone that opposes them. We used to love opposition. We used to love robust debate. And now Joe Rogan has the best experts in the field on to simply ask them intelligent questions, and people don't even want him to be able to do that. That's a Well, I think we lost Rick there, but Crystal, finish up on that, because where is the line uh, on this? To his point, Joe Rogan has also promised to make some changes, but he says he's just having conversations with people. Yeah, all, yeah, all I mean, he said think... that he was going to do was even have more guests on, have an even broader uh, you know, number of guests on. But, but here's what it happens. You don't just lose free speech when you cancel guys like Rogan and the best experts in the field. That's who he's been interviewing. You actually lose lives. We have people die because we don't have the debate to get to truth and find treatments and prevent mistakes. This is our right. health we're talking about here. We ought to want robust debate. I'd fight and die for your right to say things that I disagree with. That used to be a value in America. We need to find that value again. Crystal, where is the line? Well, yeah, I think the line is we, what, you know, alternative facts are. And what Joe Rogan has been spewing on Spotify are alternative facts. And so I don't think That's that we can say true. he's been... It is true. I don't think that we can say that he's been having a fair, balanced debate. He's been having a debate that has centered around ivermectin and alternative facts around COVID. And so that's what's dangerous. That's what's, you know, crazy, wild rhetoric that he's Be been specific. You're that making some pretty big deaths. accusations here. Be specific. What has he said that ivermectin, is an alternative fact? Iver that ivermectin is is uh, alternative to the vaccine that's been FDA approved. 143 studies that prove that. 143 Are studies that prove that. Are they FDA approved? Have they approved it for COVID is the question. It's approved Has for human use. Has the FDA been right or wrong about most of the things with COVID? No, no, no. Well, let's let's answer that question though. Is ivermectin FDA approved to prevent COVID? There is not a the vaccine on COVID. the market right now that you can get in the United States that is FDA approved for COVID. Well, so Pfizer, so what, what is what it, what is Pfizer then? What is the Pfizer? It's not vaccine? approved. It's not approved yet. The one that you can go has, get is not is it, not because FDA it has approved. emergency use authorization. Absolutely right. Yeah. So oh, let's, okay. let's make sure our words mean things. Ivermectin is proven by 143 studies to be effective in the treatment of COVID for most people. Joe Rogan is asking the best experts in the field, like Dr. Peter McCullough and Dr. Robert Malone, who developed this technology but, for these but, vaccines in the, in the term scientific best questions experts, why would you not want to give their opinion itself? on those things that even if they're wrong though, don't the you want to have experts? debate let her finish go ahead crystal well i mean he hasn't had anyone else on he hasn't had anyone on from the cdc to even balance the these quote unquote best experts and so he has he, i forget he the guy's name for the doctor that's the expert for cnn all the time i, I apologize oh, i don't know Sanjay his name Gupta. but he's the exact Sanjay yeah. Gupta. Um, yeah, but Sanjay he, Gupta isn't from the cdc let's just be clear he's a commentator that's part of what he said Rogan recently here is that he was going to pr try to do more of what you're talking about, Crystal. Hey, it's great to have you guys. We always look forward to the conversation in the popcorn panel, as we call it here. Crystal Knight and former Texas lawmaker Rick Green, thanks to you both. God bless you guys. Catch more on the Whoopi Goldberg story tonight on Dan Abrams Live. That's 8 Eastern, 7 Central.
Baby Dog tells Bette Midler and all those out there, kiss her honey. That is the governor of West Virginia, Jim Justice, telling Bette Midler what he thinks of her comments about his state. We'll tell you exactly what she said to evoke the response and ask the governor himself. Why do the so-called elites look down on West Virginia and maybe even middle America? The governor joins us next. And arrest in the overdose death of the wire actor Michael K. Williams, how fentanyl was involved and who the police have charged. Back after this. Baby dog tells Bette Midler and all those out there, kiss her honey. <laughs> All right, again, West Virginia Governor Jim Justice telling actress and singer Bette Midler just what he thinks about her during last week's State of the State address. This all stemmed from a tweet back in December in which Midler criticized Senator Joe Manchin, saying in part, he wants us all to be just like the people in his state, poor, illiterate, and strung out, a statement she later apologized for. Midler isn't the only person taking aim at Joe Manchin in West Virginia. AOC targeted the fellow Democrat over his opposition to the Build Back Better bill asking if public housing residents should seek warmth on Joe Manchin's yacht now that the spending bill is dead. As promised, joining me now, the governor himself, Jim Justice, as I like to call him, the pride of the thundering herd golf team. Governor, it's good to see you again. So let's talk about this dog stunt. Uh, what I said at the time last week was it's a good thing the governor doesn't have a horse. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true too. But Joe, <laughs> no, thank you much for having me. and. Uh... And Joe, it's not a stunt. I mean, really and truly, at the end of the day, I got a lot of pride in West Virginia. I really believe in all the good stuff that's going on in West Virginia, especially today. But I really believe in our people. I mean, our people are the best, the most appreciative. They're faith-based. They're good people that know the difference between right and wrong and are craftsmen in so many ways. And really and truly, they've been the blunt end of a lot of bad jokes over the years and a lot of tough stuff. But uh, Benton Midler didn't have any business saying that. You know, the people that really believe that West Virginia couldn't compete with other states are all the people out there that never thought it was really possible for West Virginia to become the travel destination or the diamond in the rough that they've all missed. Lo and behold, they're awakening to a new, new day, aren't they? And so in all that, I'm going to stand up for West Virginia. And uh, I just thought the best way that I could do it is roll baby dog's butt right there to the camera and just tell people exactly what baby dog and I thought. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I know you well enough from our interviews to laugh and not be surprised that you did it. Critics, though, Governor, uh, say you're just proving their point. How do you answer them? Well, I mean, first of all, if they can't laugh a little bit, <laughs> you know, then I feel sorry for them, to tell you the truth. But honest to goodness, this, this bulldog, a lot of people say, you know, what about her? Well, I mean, really and truly, at the end of the day, she makes everybody smile when you look at that face. Mm -hmm. And really, she loves everybody. And that's what we ought to be at doing. I mean, we ought, we ought not be at casting these rocks at people that you think that are just beat down and just going to take it. Well, I'm not beat down, and I'm not going to take it. And, you know, if you cast a rock at West Virginia, you know, you better expect a cannonball back because it's coming from me. All right, Governor, uh, let's, let's show you an article that I found, an opinion article in The Hill that said that West Virginia has the sixth highest child poverty rate in the nation. The Build Back Better bill would provide free universal pre-K, other policies that would help a lot of people in your state. You've been in both parties, Governor. If you were in the Senate, would you be a yes or no on Build Back Better? I'd be no. And the reason I'd be no is I'd be first and foremost for America. I mean, in all honesty, if you just step back and look at what's going on in, in D.C. and you think about Afghanistan and crime and inflation and all the different things at our borders and now Russia and, and, you know, just everything in general, do we need, do we need to perpetuate more, more, more badness coming? You know, and from the standpoint of West Virginia, I mean, look what's going on in West Virginia right now. I hate to say it, Joe because it sounds egotistical, but there's so many people, so many people that have pulled the rope and made this happen, whether it be the Senate or our House or, or, or all the different people in my cabinet and everything, on and on and on. But really and truly, when I walked in the door, West Virginia was bankrupt. 
And today we're pitching surpluses beyond belief. We've made education our centerpiece. We, we are building so many different roads, it's unbelievable. We've got pay raises, we've got everything going. Tourism exploding and every every What about travel the poverty, though, Governor? What, what, what about Virginia? the poverty? A lot of things in this Build Back Better thing address poverty, especially in children, including the child tax credit. Uh, is there any element of Build Back Better that you'd be for? Well, I'm sure there is. You know, I don't know all the all, all the particulars about Build Back Better. You know, but but you know, there's got to be stuff in it. But naturally, we'd all be for. But really and true, Joe, at the end of the day, we're going to take care of our people in West Virginia. I mean, we got this thing rolling and we're going to take care of our people in West Virginia. We don't need the federal government to set on, you know, to put us on every porch just waiting on a check to come. Really, at the end of the day, West Virginians will take care of West Virginians and we'll do it because we work. We get our hands dirty and we really work and we know how to work. So, uh, so we'll take care of West Virginia. We don't need the federal government gives, giving us a check. Senator Manchin represents your state, which former President Trump won by 40 percent. People may not realize that, but I would imagine you have some thoughts. Uh, and you gave us an idea at the end of your speech there. But what is it people on the outside don't understand about Senator Manchin or the state? Well, I mean, to be perfectly honest, Joe's a friend. You know, there's times we disagree naturally. You know, and and Joe is more of a politician than I'll ever be because he's been at it a long, long time. But in that, Joe has grounded West Virginia values, and he really knows how the how West Virginians feel and the way West Virginians speak. You know, Joe is echoing our voices, and that's what Joe should do. You know, and and I commend him in every way for his courage. Because I know the level of the pressures, at least I can just imagine, you know, so uh, so at the end of the day, I think really and true what Joe Manchin is doing is echoing West Virginians values. And that's what Joe Manchin should do as our senior sen uh, senator. But Democrats would argue he's not echoing their concerns. Now, say that one more time, Joe. I'm sorry. Democrats would argue, though, that he's not echoing the party's concerns. And well, again, for what I, would I be, the, in sorry. their opinion, in the best the best interest of the country, to your point. No question. I mean, and, and Joe, let's be real. I mean, do the Democrats on the national level even have a party? It is the most bizarre thing you have ever seen in your life. And you know it. And I know it, too. And, and really and truly, we're just on a timetable to see the total meltdown and destruction of that party, per se. I mean, it is the most bizarre thing in the world, right. and it's a crime thing. Well, and, and I know I appreciate the fact that you've been on both sides. I mean, there, it's the Democrats aren't a lone ranger on that. Well, I mean, that's exactly right. But, but you know, from, from my standpoint, in West Virginia, we have Democrats. But for the most part, they are conservative-thinking, solid people. I mean, naturally, you have, and I, and I hate to call them nut jobs, but you've got some ultra-left, ultra-left. And you probably got some ultra, ultra, ultra right. But really and truly, the significant majority of West Virginians are conservative, rock solid people. And West Virginia now, thank God, is solidly Republican. Well, it's solidly in the uh, national spotlight, the political spotlight, that's for sure. And Joe Manchin has uh, arguably become the most important Joe in Washington, D.C. Governor, it's always good to have you. Thank you for the time. We'll talk to you soon. All right, Joe, thank you so much. Thank you for all you do every day. All right, you bet. Take care. Quick note, as we head to break here, you can follow us on social media at Joe Donlin TV. Another day, another sea of blue in New York. Officers coming out in full force to honor the second fallen NYPD officer shot in a domestic dispute. The funeral comes the day before President Biden goes to New York to talk crime. Is that too little too late? Should the president be talking more about the violence against police? city thanks you. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. And every day that I walk the streets of New York, the people of this city reminds me, support our police and let them know we appreciate them. That was New York City Mayor Eric Adams speaking at the funeral of NYPD officer Wilbur Mora, who was shot and killed in the line of duty almost two weeks ago now, along with his partner, officer Jason Rivera. 
More recently, two Virginia campus police officers, J.J. Jefferson and John Painter, were shot and killed during an active shooter situation at Bridgewater College just yesterday. According to the National Fraternal Order of Police, 30 officers were shot in the line of duty just last month alone. Four were killed. And then you had the Virginia shooting yesterday, which increases the total again to five, plus the college patrol officer. Amid this war on the police, President Biden set to meet with Mayor Eric Adams in New York tomorrow to talk crime, something he hasn't been particularly outspoken about until this event. Joining me now for more, syndicated columnist and News Nation senior contributor, George Will. George, he does tweet about these things, I've noticed, but I wonder, shouldn't he say something and be more out front? And I mean, it seems to me like it would have gone a long way had he gone to New York for at least one of these funerals. Well, there are limits to what a, the president can do about local crime, which is a local problem and a local issue. However, this is Mr. Biden's way of saying, I'm not that kind of Democrat. What kind? Two years ago, the Democrats did themselves tremendous injury and almost lost control of the House of Representatives with one of the most destructive slogans in American political history, defund the police. Yep. This is one way for Mr. Biden to associate himself with world's largest, the nation's largest police force in New York City, and to say, as Bill Clinton did in his famous sister soldier moment, when he had a spat with a left-wing entertainer who was saying irresponsible things, I'm not that kind of Democrat. And by the way, while he's in New York, he ought to have someone arranged to ask him a question. The question would be, Mr. President, New York has decided that non-citizens, 800,000 non-citizens, are going to be allowed to vote. Right. Do you agree with that? That would give him another occasion to say, I'm not that kind of Democrat. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, he has said he's opposed to defunding the police. But again, I think maybe his absence at that funeral says a lot more than his attendance would have meant to everyone there. It, it would have helped. And uh, the president is... Uh, not for the first time playing catch up. But let me r remind you of something, Joe. In February 1968, the beginning of a presidential election year and a terrible year in American history, Martin Luther King assassinated in April, Robert Kennedy in June. Mm -hmm. February 1968, when America had a feeling somewhat like the feeling today that the social fabric is fraying, the Gallup polling organization asked Americans a question, and it was this. Is there a place near you, say within a mile of your house, where you are afraid to walk at night alone? Only 19% of men said they were afraid, but 50% of American women said yes. Mm. That meant, as the political class immediately understood, that half of the men in America were married to women who were afraid of crime. Mm. This was a political issue in 1970, it became a political issue throughout the decade. It presaged a move of the country to the right, and of course the decade ended with the election of Ronald Reagan. So crime has been a big issue before, is today, and will be for the foreseeable future. You are the historian, George, so remind folks who weren't around perhaps or don't remember the last time we've had crime waves like this, what led to things turning around and what can we do now to turn this around? Well, one of the things that, that uh, leads to crime, frankly, is a large cohort of young men aged 16 to 24, because they commit a large portion of the crime. So there are demographic reasons. Uh, there are also, when you have a, a, a new substance, a new illegal substance enters the, re, enters the conversation, such as crack in the, in the early 1980s. Right. So various things can contribute to this. But it always c comes back as a political issue that the first thing, the first thing that government is supposed to guarantee is order and safety. And crime represents, therefore, the primary, the fundamental government failure. Well, we mentioned getting tough on crime because that's been the response through many of these waves. But some would argue we got too tough on crime, which is part of how we got to kind of where we are right now. Well, there is a case for the fact that we're, perhaps we're sending too many people to jail for too many things that should not be criminalized. We certainly have a very high incarceration rate in this country, and that breeds to more crime because everyone who goes to prison, almost all of them are coming back home to the neighborhoods from which they were taken to go to prison. 
and a lot of them don't come back from prison improved by the experience. Right. So we wanted to be, make sure that with the, the kind of the multiplication of the criminalization of behavior in this country that we're not overdoing it and that we're incarcerating the right people for the right amount of time. So this, this is an ongoing argument, and it comes and goes in waves. We now are in the midst of a rising wave of discontent, mm -hmm. and if the government doesn't address it, they'll get different governors. Yeah. Well, it, it brings to mind, George, something that I'll always remember. I talked with a young offender in a correctional institute, and I asked him through the bars, are you learning anything in here? And he said, I'm learning how not to get caught next time. <laughs> well, that's the sad thing, because yeah. a, a, a prison can be a school for, a postgraduate school for crime when you're released, and we don't want that. No. George Will, it's always good to have you. Thanks for the time. Glad to be with you. We've talked about the ongoing fentanyl crisis extensively on our show here, and now Customs and Border Protection releasing some new numbers to back up just how much fentanyl is coming across our southern border in particular. Officers at eight South Texas ports of entry from Brownsville to Del Rio say they saw a 1,066% increase in fentanyl seized in fiscal year 2021 for a total of 588 pounds of fentanyl. And for some perspective, we've shown you this before, we'll show you again. This is how much fentanyl it takes to kill a person. And perhaps the scariest part, it's often laced into counterfeit pills, and many users don't even know they're taking it. Joining me now for more, News Nation's border reporter, he's at the southern border, Robert Sherman. So, Robert, you spoke with the DEA, and they had some warnings about these fake pills and how people can tell the difference. They did, Joe, and put it simply, uh, unless you're a pharmacist, you're going to have a hard time telling the difference. The DEA tells us that a lot of the fentanyl pills that they're seeing have been designed and manufactured to look exactly like the kind of pills that a doctor may prescribe to you or me. Uh, back in uh, this past month over in Austin, the DEA says that they had a big drug bust there and they found all of these fentanyl pills that to the untrained eye looked exactly like oxycodone. So the main message is, and it's a simple one, unless you've been prescribed medication by a doctor and unless you're getting it from CVS, Walgreens, or your local pharmacy, you shouldn't be taking it because they're seeing more and more fentanyl come across that border and a lot of it looks pretty convincing. And where it's going, Robert, is all across the country. We know there's a pipeline up the West Coast, and a lot of it is coming up into the Midwest as well, to the South, up onto the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, it's, it's basically going from where you are all across the country. Yeah, potentially, Joe. It could be coming here from Eagle Pass, Texas. Could be coming up your way to Chicago or to New York or any one of these northern cities that are nowhere near the border. Uh, we spoke to the local sheriff's office today. Take a listen to this. I can go anywhere. You know, we've had cases where there's a vehicle that crossed through here and they catch them in Louisiana. Or it could be even farther up north than that. And the uh, attorney general from West Virginia was saying earlier uh, last week that uh, he blames much of the fentanyl crisis that they're seeing in their state on drugs coming across the U.S.-Mexico border. So it's a big deal. And it has a wide-spanning impact, Joe. Yeah, News Nation border reporter Robert Sherman, thanks for the uh, report tonight. Appreciate it. Another drug that dealers are lacing with fentanyl is heroin. And as of just a few hours ago, four people have now been arrested in New York, accused of supplying the drugs to actor Michael K. Williams, who overdosed on fentanyl-laced heroin in his apartment back in September. Police say they've been working for months to bring justice in this case. Williams, of course, made famous by his role in, among other things, The Wire. An Illinois man mysteriously disappears after a car crash. How witnesses are helping police retrace his steps. That's tonight on News Nation Prime, 9 Eastern, 8 Central. Now, two former NFL coaches say their former bosses offered them money to lose games intentionally. If that's true, what does it mean for all the bets being placed on games? Can we trust the outcome? The professional gambler who calls himself the Philly Godfather joins us next to tell us if this kind of thing is actually baked into the odds. Back after this. 
All right, tonight, more controversy in the NFL. One day after former Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores sued the NFL and his former team for racial discrimination, Flores also alleged that Miami Dolphins owner Stephen Ross offered him $100,000 to lose games, or as it's called, tank. Now another former head coach, Hugh Jackson, is saying that Cleveland Browns owner Jimmy Haslam offered him money to tank. That's according to a source in response to a tweet. That said, Browns owner Haslam wasn't offering Jackson $100,000 per loss. Jackson replied, trust me, it was a good number. Joining me now is the owner of the sports website, the Philly Godfather, Steve Maltepa. Steve, it's great to see you. I, I saw this story today and thought, holy cow. I mean, uh, either that or you're not surprised. Which is it? I mean, if these allegations are true, it's going to send shockwaves throughout the NFL and the sports betting market. Uh, it's big, especially in this day and age that sports betting has become legal. This is a market like any other market and any kind of insider trading that was involved. If anyone from those teams knew about this type of tanking and they were betting these games, there could be some serious uh, criminal investigation here. I mean, there's a there's a line history, so you can go back in time and see how these lines have moved. Right. And, if the, and if anyone was betting these games with knowledge of this information, there's some serious problems. I'm wondering how they would do that, Steve. I mean, the, a, a coach on his own, without the players knowing maybe, or is he going to sit certain players? How how does a coach do this without making it obvious? Well, we've seen it in the NBA before, and I think Mark Cuban went on the Dan Patrick's show, and he talked about how they actually did it, and the NBA fined Mark Cuban for going on the show. I think it was about $600,000. And they said what they do is they don't tell the players to lose, but they start the younger players, the more inefficient players, and let, they play, let them play longer, and that's how they tank in the NBA. Uh, but if you look at the 76ers, they've tanked for the last few years, and it hasn't worked out for them. So even right. if you tank, it doesn't mean you're going to end up winning, you know, winning football games. Well, let's ask you a little more about that in a minute, but I'm wondering about this tanking thing because you know as well as I do, Steve, there have been teams that everyone thought was going to lose, and then they won. It was the last game of the season, and had they lost, they'd have gotten the number one pick, but they won anyway. And I know the Eagles have been tied up in some of this as well. So I guess the question is, how do you, how do you know? I mean, it's so difficult. And at first, when, when Hugh Jackson was talking about getting paid 100000 uh, or the, the initial reports came out that he was getting paid 100000 a game to lose, it didn't make any sense to me because the Cleveland Browns were so bad before him. And then when he got fired with a 3-36-1 and and record, uh, they were bad after him as, with uh, Kitchens as coach. And why would you end up tying a game that you can you know lose and get another $100,000 in your pocket? So that didn't make any sense to me. It's going to be very, very difficult to prove. Uh, and then then what happens to Hugh Jackson? I mean, if he did take this money, right. well, then he loses all his integrity, and he should never coach an NFL team, a mm. high school team, a Pee Wee football team ever again could, because he's been compromised. And what's to say a gambler doesn't go and give him money to, to throw right. a game? Well, Steve, the other question I have is what can the NFL do about this? I know it's been kicked around. Should they have a, a lottery? Should they maybe have like an end-of-year tournament where the bottom four or eight teams play? Or maybe you get – points based on whether you win you move up in the draft or lose at the end and you move down yeah as a professional sports better we're always looking for teams that you know a certain part of the season where we know they can't make the playoffs and the best thing for them to do is tank and we'll usually look to fade those teams depending on what the price on the game is but the nfl has a <laughs> it's it's a tough situation for them how do they fix this problem uh how do they uh you know make it go away and it's, it's very difficult. I mean, once a team knows that they're not good enough to make the playoffs, they start they start their uh, more inefficient players. Right. It's just it's just a tough problem altogether. Yeah, I like the idea of this late season tournament with four or eight teams. You know, because they can play it during the playoffs, and we get more football. I mean, and then maybe there's a little bit something on the line, and whoever wins that uh, single elimination tournament uh, moves moves up in the draft to get the number one pick. Anyway. It's all conjecture. We'll guess, I guess, what happens, but this isn't going anywhere. Steve, it's great to see you. The Philly Godfather. Take care. Good luck. All right, it is now official. The U.S. debt topping $30 trillion. That's what it looks like for those counting at home. Those are 13 zeros. So what does it mean for you and me? Well, each of us in the U.S. currently on the hook for $90,000. Every man, woman, and child living in the country. Not just the feds that will come calling for that money, though. It's the Chinese as well. Leland Vitter. The show on balance starts at the top of the hour. So we owe them big time, essentially. Trillion dollars. One thir one thirtieth of the U.S. debt. Uh, you know, there's that old line that if you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank owns you. If you right. owe the bank a billion dollars, you own the bank. So if you owe the bank a trillion dollars, being the Chinese, uh, it cuts both ways. 
What do you have on the show tonight? Hey, we got a couple of things. Interesting enough, a new reason why your favorite booze will be out of stock and does not have to do with the supply chain. Oh, really? Yes, well, but it's a- true. And in fact, actually, there's a lot of liquor now that is doubling in prices. Wow. That's what you call a good tease right there. Thanks, Leland. We'll see you at the top of the hour. I didn't write it. Some amazing video of a woman jumping out of a second story window to escape a fire. What broke her fall? We'll have that ahead. this video out. First responders arrive at a raging house fire to help trapped victims make a leap of faith. Body cam video captured deputies in Illinois responding to reports of two people trapped upstairs. The force of the woman's 20-foot fall knocked the deputy to the ground, but he did break that fall. Moments later, a second victim seen jumping from the flaming window as well as they helped her too. The victims said to be okay, largely thanks to those deputies who were there to catch him. Our American Snapshot now also involves police doing great things. Police from departments around the Pittsburgh area showed up to the Children's Hospital to deliver badges to a patient fighting cancer. Eight-year-old Joshua caught their attention after several social media posts circulated talking about his love for police patches. Special delivery also included notes of encouragement. That's our American Snapshot. In fact, our first, because we have another, and it's a show of support for a fallen police officer to honor another brother in blue murdered on the streets of New York. Thousands of officers lined Fifth Avenue to salute NYPD Detective Wilbert Mora one last time. That, our second American snapshot for the night. A picture brought to us, by the way, courtesy of the Sparta, New Jersey Police Department and Brian Haslock, a detective there. That's our time. We appreciate you being with us on Balance with Leland Vittert next. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.